hours. In this episode, golly, mister, is that an FN 49? Why, yes. Yes, it is. Plumbing like you've never had it explained before. Not much gack here. No need for a full conservation. Fire control group. Reassembly. Viola. Sometimes you run into a mill syrup that doesn't actually need the full conservation. It just needs to be taken apart, cleaned, oiled, and inspected. This particular FN49 just needs that. There's no rust on it. It's been out of the stock recently. So we're just gonna take this thing apart, show you how it works, and put it back together again. Uh, we'll talk about the gas system too, because that seems to be kicking everybody's butt. So we'll get down there, down the rabbit hole for the FN49. It's a pretty epic spring in this thing. I mean, it closes with a great deal of authority. And like with most properly designed guns, the spring does two things. So this entire carriage here can be pushed forward. Oh, wait a minute. You have to lift that flap up back there. We'll talk about that flap in a minute. It exposes a hole that allows you to clear the, clean the bore without coming to the rear. Okay, so that slides forward and then if lifted off, there is a nested double spring that's pretty darn strong here. So you gotta respect that. Um, this was what we had to flip up before this lever here and that's actually covering a hole in the back end of the receiver back here that allows you to drive a cleaning rod down the long axis, you see. So the next thing we would wind up doing is bringing the bolt back till it can be lifted clear. And you've pretty much field stripped the back end of the gun in order to work on it. This is the bolt, firing pin, extractor, um, everything nice and tidy and it locks down. Hang on a minute here, let me get my hands out of the way. When the, when the barrel goes, when a bolt goes in, it locks down like this. So this is set up like a Simonov, it's set up like an SVT-40. Um, all of these guns were delivered around the same time and it's not as much I don't think it's as play as much plagiarism as you think it is I honestly think that if you put reasonably intelligent engineering guys in the room and they've already seen anything that the answers become pretty flippant obvious I mean there's a reason why all successful automobiles still have four tires um, you know unless you're a dumb Dimaxian freak <laughs> this screw backs out of a hole on the other side this is the boss that it goes in this screw holds this cap on and when this cap comes right here on top of my thumb that's sliding out of a recess in the upper handguard that pops out comes away and then you can see here this tooth right there and that part slides and it traps the handguard down this exposes the gas system which I'll tell you in a previous take, I had taken this gas ring off of, and I'll show you that here in just a second anyway. Press through, rotate, and remove. So when you take this off, and you can see this gas plug's a little horked up here. It's, the gun's dirty. It's had a, probably 100 rounds put through it, and it needs to be cleaned. That's why I said this thing is in pretty good shape, and it didn't need a conservation. It just needed to be torn down. That will allow, well, let me get this out of the way. Hand guard comes off. We'll talk about all this, springs and everything. When we go to put it back together again, it'll make a lot more sense. This whole mess can now come out the front. All right. And this is just gas piston. And you, you, you can see it's dirty, but it's not screwed up. This gun's actually in pretty good shape. We have our gas tube here. The gas port is, is in the barrel right about there. And then we have a rotating valve. Let's take a quick look at how all this works. You can do one of two things. Here we have a barrel with a gas port in it. All right, we got a place set right here through the inside of the tube. And as the bullet is going this way, there's gas pressure that wants to come out here. All right, so what are we gonna do with that gas pressure? 
there are several things you can do. But in the Navy parlance, this is how you draw a valve. Okay? So things can flow through this valve one way or the other. So you can do one of two things. In this FN49, there's actually a valve right on top of the barrel, and that's the valve that sets whether or not we're going to be able to run the system or not run it. It's an on-off switch. Now, in, in any other gun, there's two different things you can do. You can either control how much gas you dump, so this is a dump, or you can control how much gas you supply. And this is a supply. Okay? So we've got the on, off, grenade, not grenade. Hang on a minute. This is the inside of the barrel. Let me make sure that everybody can see that. And then in the FN49's case, we have a dump. The supply is just straight through. It either gets supplied or not. So this is always open, even though it's not even there. But I'm just diagrammingly saying that if there was a valve there, it would be always open. And then this is throttled. Okay, our dump is throttled. The other way you can do it, say on a Garand, you can't even shut a Garand off. It's just this with no valves. You have the gas you have. On an 1187, you actually have a spring-loaded dump and this valve is open on an M14. It's a given gas supply, except it's a short tappet. So you can either have all the gas you want and get rid of what you don't want, or you can ha get all the gas you're going to get and then control how much of it goes in. This is very rarely done. There's very rarely a variable orifice on the supply because at the pressures and temperatures that the gas runs at, you get a lot of corrosion, you get a lot of um, erosion, flow-induced erosion. So on a normal gun, this valve isn't even here. On a normal gun, you would have, let me crank up a little bit here. On a normal gun, you would just have a supply that would turn around the corner, and there's your supply, and then there is your variable dump. And this is how the FN49 is set up. This gets rid of stuff, that doesn't. There is one other way to do this. And we've seen it on the World War I weapons, say, um, the 1914 Hotchkiss. They had their supply. And then this dumped into a great big chamber that had a piston in it on one end. And this is the thing that you, that you cranked around on. You wound this in and out. And then the main piston that drove the action sat here like this. Let me pick this up just a little bit more. So this is the action. And what they were doing was this contra piston actually controlled the amount of volume in here. Volume. Okay, and the more you wound this out, the more a given amount of gas had room to expand before it acted on the action piston. You don't see this either because you pull the trigger one time on that Hotchkiss and you had better take this apart and clean it or it will be a pile of orange slag before you go to bed. Ignore that, I just wanted to show you guys that. So essentially, this is your FN49 right here. Barrel, supply, dump, and then it's got a, um, an on-off valve right here that just lets you select auto or off. There it is. So this is one of those that actually has the main valve here. You can see when it's an automatic, gas can come in that hole and it exits out that hole that way like that i'm going to turn it over and let you see it there's the that's where the gas would go in if you had it rolled over like this boom you see how it hooks up optically i mean obviously i'm out of plane this way so as the gas goes into this cylinder 
this piston is sitting right up against here. So it'll begin to get its initial movement. And then as it comes rearward, it uncovers that gas port. Remember that this is inside this tube. So it'll uncover this gas port and it just pokes the bolt carrier and the bolt carrier takes off to the rear and then it dumps out the top. So the way we, we turn it on and off, that's off, so that's probably where you'd be launching a grenade. I don't know what R stands for. Um, I don't know. It's we're, we're, we're trying to determine whether or not that R is a French acronym or a Spanish acronym. We don't know. I'm going to make the assumption that A is automatique. I don't know. But when you turn it on, the gas will show up here. And then you have this dump that's threaded down over the top of it. So... These holes have absolutely nothing to do with this system's ability to dump gas. I'm guessing two things. I know that this is where a spanner goes to help you move this. And I'm guessing that those holes are drilled there to allow you to run oil through them all over these threads so you can break this thing loose. That's what I'm guessing. But as you screw this on and off these threads, there's no dumping going on. That's maximum gas. And there's full dumping going on, that's minimum gas. And that's just done by ro rotating this around this cylinder. Let's get this up in there and see if I can do that. All right. This is a spring clip that's letting it tick. And the further in you go with this, the more it will close off the gas port. I'm not going to run around right now because it's, it's dirty. We haven't even cleaned it yet. So that's maximum dump, and then if you screwed this down on those threads, that would come all the way up here, and it would go to minimum dump. And then you could shut it off if you wanted to by just rolling this around this way, and it totally blanks off the gas port on the bottom. So that's the answer to the question. Somebody asked me, how do you control gas? And I would say you run this sleeve all the way back and then shoot around, and if the action doesn't operate all the way, Keep running that up until it just operates and I'd come around one or two more clicks and call it home. And um, then you won't be beating your brass up and more importantly, won't be beating the snot out of the back end of the receiver. Well, I hope that makes everything clear as mud. All right, we have the bottom metal here. By the way, I know I keep saying this is a Spanish 49. It's not Spanish, it's Argentine Navy. Um, but we were talking about the language Spanish and I got a little bit confused. I don't care. I work on the equipment that's in the room in front of me. So what I'm doing now is pulling a lock screws out, which is, uh, we're going to have to back that big one up just a little bit to back this one up because it's holding up the lock screw. There we go. Get in there. Fingers, fingers everywhere. There we go. Right, and that should be coming out right there. Okay, one more. Let's get that down in there. This had to have been some kind of cadet's gun because it has never been anywhere near the ocean. It's kind of got that Sunkerite looking um, number four Mark II paint on it. I don't know all this. I just know that I don't want to mess this paint up because I'm not the one that's going to want to have to Spartan shield this thing when I'm, when I'm done with it. So here we go. We'll pull the big screws out. Uh, this would be a good time to mention that there are only two kinds of ships in the Navy. There are submarines and there are targets. And with all due respect to the crewmen that died on the Belgrano, I think we know, I think we know how that went. All right. I'm sorry. I'm moving to focus everywhere, Bruno. I'm sorry. I'm running these now the way I have this captured in the vise back here don't you don't don't focus on it but you see this felt pad because when I pop that metal screw I expect the action to drop out and the fire control group to come out the top that's my expectation because so far this entire piece of equipment appears to have been engineered in such a way that the village idiot can work on it yeah there we go get in there yeah good good I have every light in the shop on so the the um we've stopped down so our depth of field is good but not good enough to cover you know 10 or 12 inches okay here we go this should come out all right fire control group comes out oh my 
Where have we seen that before? Okay. This is the fire control group. We'll tear this down. We'll keep moving. And then I'm assuming that when I pop this up out of the vise, that this entire axle is just going to fall at the bottom. Viola. In this arrangement, I'm going to let you guys in on a secret here. When you get a gun that's not dirt impacted, rust encrusted, there isn't goo oozing out of everything, you don't really need to tear this fire control group down much further than it already is. So we're going to talk about it here and not fight all these springs, but I'm going to show you what they all do. The safety on this piece of equipment is just a simple lever. And what this lever does, this is a track right here. There's a track milled into this trigger. And as this safety rides in and out of it here, it comes down through this track and just mechanically locks the trigger. Not only that, it's, you can't even get your finger to it. So it blocks mechanical access to it and it locks it so you can't move it. When it's unlocked, you have this cassette moving. Now the thing I wanna point out is this plunger, all right? So what this plunger is telling me is that there's a spring inside of this area and that spring is pushing up on the top of this housing while this guide plunger guides it. There are several other things here. You see how this is spring loaded? Okay, so it's all done on one, there's a spring inside this pushing down and there's a spring there. So to cock the gun, this would be brought back by the top of the bolt and it would cock. So it's being held by the upper set of springs and by the way, if, or upper set of fingers. And if you want to see this exact arrangement, drop the fire control group out of a Garin. They're a lot more common around here than, than Na Argentine Naval FN49s. But this is how it's done on a Garin. This is how it was done on the RSC. This is how it's done um, on the A5, the Auto 5. Now, the early Auto 5s do not have this spring-loaded feature. So what happens when this, when you have the trigger back, this will come down, push that rear hook out of the way and snap over it, right? But you notice my finger hasn't moved. You can do this trigger where these two are solid. The problem is it slaps your finger every time. So if you go back and look at the beginning of that checkering episode, I got 11 rounds out of that A5 and my finger felt like I had just hit a knuckleball on a 40 degree day when I got done with that. There's another feature here that goes on. Well, hang on a minute. Let me show you this. So the hammer's going to, you pull the trigger, the hammer comes forward, and then it comes back under cocking. It cocks, and then when you turn your finger loose, it's ready to go again. I've mentioned this before, but I will tell you, never dry fire one of these things when they're out of the gun, because that is an epic spring, and all of that energy's got to go somewhere. The other feature they built into this is look down here where my finger is. As the hammer comes back, you see that pin sticking out. Tactile confirmation that the gun is cocked in the middle of the night. You don't have to stroke the bolt in order to find out. You probably notice that this hammer is banging around, right? Well, the hammer needs to be up here in order to do what it's got to do to the firing pin. Here's the firing pin right here. That's all the way up here like this, right? So in order to get the hammer up that high, the gun would have to be a lot thicker. So what they've done is they've made this hammer be nice and tall when it's up here. But as you cock it, there's an oblong hole in the hammer. And then when it goes over center, pop, it pops down. And what we've just done is made the fire control group a quarter of an inch shorter. And that may not sound like a lot to you, but a quarter of an inch is that much steel you don't have to lug around. And if you ask anybody that's ever had to tote a battle rifle in combat, they'll tell you they would sand the paint off that thing to take two ounces worth of weight off of it. So that's pretty much everything we have there. And now we move forward. And there is a drive pin right here that's holding the ejector. And it's also holding the um, bolt stop. There's a spring-loaded bolt stop over here. So let me reposition and show you what I'm talking about. 
So in order to understand what you're looking at here, you got to take a look at the back of this mag. There's a, 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 an arm here, and that arm, when this magazine is inserted into the mag wall, it grabs right here on the front, and then it just kicks up. And i got to hold it onto it because the rest of the gun's not here. It'll kick up. And as it goes up, do you see this tip come up? When that bar rises or drops, right there, see it moving up and down? That is what stops the bolt on an empty mag. Right? So this feature stops the bolt on an empty mag. To stop the bolt because you want to hold it open on purpose, there is a lever. Where you go? Right there. You see the, that, that projection sticking out in there? If you pull the bolt back and push in on this, this will hold it open. So you have two different ways to hold the bolt open. And then this is kind of sloppy, but when you put the, the stock bolt in, you see how that all lines up? All of a sudden, you have a non-precision piece that's being held in a very precision place, and yet it's extremely easy to get out by just knocking out that pin. This, of course, is the magazine hold in there's a spring back there recoiling up into it and that's pretty much the bottom metal this is very elegant and it's made well enough to do what it needs to do so right here by the word belgique is this cool little piece of kit right here and there's the back side of it right there and that is a removable headspace block this is the abutment on this gun, but as the gun wears, just like on an FN FAL, you can put thicker and thicker and thicker tabs in here, thicker this way, to move the bolt forward to accommodate anywhere that's happening up in the throat. And again, here's the access for a cleaning rod to come directly down the bore so that you're doing your cleaning from behind so that you don't wear on the crown. We do not want to wear on the crown on any gun because we need a clean release of the projectile out of the rifling. So always clean your weapons from behind if you can do that. All right, I got it all laid out here just really quickly to have it all in one spot. We talked about the bottom metal with the hammer, trigger, all those springs. We have the bolt. We have the bolt carrier, and we're going to uptie here in just a second and show you what that does. This is the tappet rod gas piston with the return spring. You've seen this on other guns. The, um, the K43 had that. The, 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 the Soviet gun has it. We have the gas system that we've had a quick dis uh, discussion about. This is the valve that turns it on and off. And then this is the dump, the variable dump that dumps what we don't want out the top. Nose metal. And then we have the action with the built-in mag tube, the dump on the top barrel and receiver group there's not much to this thing he was actually very it's a simple gun um, so two things i'm going to interject here since we started filming this and one was this particular fn 49 has a has a firing pin interlock that says that the bolt carrier has to be all the way over the top of the bolt for the firing pin to come forward um, and that's a big one. And then someone else said, hey, why didn't you mention the fact that the Garand had, you know, when you plug a grenade launcher into the Garand, it dumps all the gas so the bolt doesn't cycle. Yeah, but that's not a throttle for us. Um, it's there, but it's not a design. Like on an M14, you can turn the gas off and turn it on with an actual user-controlled gizmo. That's where I was. We can nitpick this left and right. All this is going to get is a quick toothbrush and a little bit of my favorite gun scrubber, in my case, kerosene. Nothing fancy here. Um, we're just going to clean it and get ready to throw it back together again and make sure that it works. Let's get up on a vise here. I want to show you something. This is the bolt up close. Um, we have what I wanted to show was this is a firing pin set up that says that the firing pin is only allowed to go forward if this device here is allowed to come up and what it comes up into is this recess back here in the bolt carrier so when the bolt carrier is all the way forward down over the top of this thing and locked it allows this firing pin um, 
uh, interlock to come up and make sure that you can't get to the back end of the, uh, the firing pin can't get to the cartridge unless it's totally in battery. So the gas pushes on this rod right here and then it pumps back. So all it's got to do is just give this a little kick in the pants. And by the time it gets back here, it's dumped all the gas pressure off and it goes away. And then this continues to the rear. So to see the camming action of all the surfaces, we can roll this up under here. Let me move a light over it. There we go. So as the operating rod comes to the rear, you can see that it cams the rear end of the bolt surface up and off of this replaceable head spacing lug here. So as that lifts off, it then grabs the bolt and tows the boat to the rear, picks up another round, comes in, and as it chambers the round, the bolt will drop to the bottom. And as it drops to the bottom, this um, carrier now has room for the firing pin interlock to lift into this lock in the bolt carrier. And if you strike the rear end of the firing pin, the cartridge will go off. It's a pretty simple system. Um, multiple guns have it. The SVT-40 has this. The K-40, the KG-43 um, has it. Um, a variety of guns have it. Some of the more modern AR-15s have them as an add-on. Um, it's not a new idea. It's been around for a long time. And, um, you know, this is just pretty pretty solid now if instead of using gas moving a piston you just move the entire barrel moving now you've got a Johnson automatic you've got any of uh, uh, any number of short recoil unlocking guns that way very simple very robust very well done there's this nice mist going everywhere and all right I, I run my shop there real hard I run it at about 150 pounds, and I had Bruno back the camera up so we don't frag the lens here. You don't use full strength there when you're blowing out gun parts. You throttle it. You use it for blowing stuff out. Now, in this fire control group, for instance, I could use full pressure air, but you get into some of the more delicate, like 19... 70s onward like you get some old winchester 1300 or 1400 and you take a full full blast on that and plastic and springs and all kinds of crap are going to come flying out of it don't do that now if you look hard at a lot of guns that are built i got this thing all nice and clean and oiled and it's sparkly you'll love that we have the gas dump ring here the actual gas dump orifice is up here we have the lubricating hole so that this whole section of threads can be kept from freezing up solid. We have the large holes that allows us to put a, um, a spanner wrench in there and set this thing. This setup, you'll see this, it made its comeback a little while ago in the indirect impingement like the AR-15s did it where the gas will come through and move this rod to the rear. And I've got this thing now. It would not do that when we had it. So we've come outside, we have not put the forward handguard on because we're going to want to try some gas adjustments. I've got this slid all the way back and the dump is open. So I actually don't expect this to uh, kick around out. Um, but we'll see. So let's see if we can track where the brass is going. Well, it blew the brass all the way over there. So I would have to think that the, um, the adjustment's right. I would have to think the adjustment's right, wouldn't you? A couple of my interns dropped by, so we let them have a poke at it. And it still works. So we got, what, a total of six rounds, seven rounds through this thing now with this gas setting. That's perfect. <laughs> the FN49, uh, walnut, steel, heavy, old school. But not a bad piece of kit. And to be really honest, it's the first time I've ever fired one, only the second time I've ever taken one apart. And as always, it's been a pleasure to help you guys out. Maybe I answered some questions. See you on the backside.